Heavenly Father, we, we, we just love your word. We love what this passage has to say. And as we go through your word together, I pray, Lord, that we would grow in our knowledge of you. That as you draw us into who you are through the preaching of your word, through the teaching of your word, through the reading of your word, and the studying of your word, I pray, Lord God, that you would awaken our hearts to the reality of the world that we live in. The spiritual reality, the physical reality, the emotional reality, the cultural reality. I just expose all of these things, again, as Paul prays for the Ephesians, for the church, that you would open the eyes of our heart. I pray that that would happen this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. So I'm going to do some, some interaction with you guys, okay? Um, I want you to, again, share with your neighbor, okay, the last best meal you've had, okay? Think about the last meal that you had that was like one of your favorites, okay? What it was. Think about the ingredients that went into it. Think about where you had it, what it smelled like, okay? And I want you to take the next minute to describe it to the person next to you. Ready? Set. Go. Spirituality, 
right? It's this idea that, that I'm here, or your teacher's there, or maybe a friend or whatever is explaining to you who God is from the Bible, right? Or sharing to you from the Bible. But unless you've tasted and actually seen the goodness and the glory of God, none of this really makes any sense, okay? And that's Paul's prayer for you. And it's interesting because Paul is praying to people who have faith and who are acting out and living out their Christian life, okay? Look at verse 15. It says, for this reason, okay, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, which means that this is how the Ephesians have their church put together. They get together and they increase in their faith of the, uh, in Jesus Christ, and they have love toward all the saints, which means that this church isn't just a church that serves themselves, but this is a church that serves other churches as well. This is an incredible place to be, right? This is the place where you go and you grow in your faith in Jesus Christ, and you learn how to love one another, okay? That's a big deal. This is really what we want in a church, so, so how, how would Paul pray for them, right? In what way would he be praying for them? And basically what he does is he shows us that this is not the end game of Christianity. And some of us think that that's really what this is supposed to be about. In fact, a lot of times we receive cultural pressure as Christians, as churches in America, to, to behave in this manner. That the reason why you go to church is so you can increase in your faith and that you can increase in love and that's all the church is supposed to do. But the truth is, it goes beyond that. And that's what Paul wants to express to the Ephesians, right? Look at verse um, 16. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So he's thankful that the church is this way. And he wants to continue to pray for them, verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. So how does Paul pray for this church? This church that's growing in faith, this church that's growing in love, how does he pray for them? That the spirit of wisdom, uh, that the God may give them the spirit of wisdom and of the revelation in the knowledge of him, right? The thing that he wants this church to do is to continue to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, okay? That's what he wants for them because that's when Christianity becomes real, Right? Because we live in a moral culture where being nice to each other is good, right? Being loving towards each other is good. Um, having some kind of faith is fine, right? But we don't live in a church that, li we don't live in a world and culture that lifts up necessarily growing deeper into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And in fact, this may not even be the values of your own house, right? You may be in a Christian family and you may come to church every Sunday, but how much do you as a family pursue the knowledge of Jesus Christ? How much is that the purpose of life for you as a family, right? And so we have, to, we have to separate those two things. We have to recognize that, yes, going to church, growing in faith, and um, loving each other and growing in that is all good, but that's not ultimately the end goal. The goal of a Christian is not to just get there. It's to go beyond that, right? And it's to grow in our knowledge of Christ, our knowledge of God. Verse 18 having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might. Okay. So this is a huge section and we're going to kind of dive in deep, but here's what you need to know. Okay. Let's, let's go back to the top of verse 18. Okay. This is the, the, the wording that Paul uses. He says, Having the eyes of your hearts and mind, and he says, that you may know, okay, that you may know, okay, so I want to focus on that for a second, okay, so the phrase, that you may know, okay, um, is in the Greek, epignosis, which means a real, a deep, a full, an intimate, and thorough knowledge, okay? that's the word that's used here for the word know. It means real, deep, full, intimate, and thorough knowledge. This is the kind of knowing that Paul wants us to have of Christ. Okay? Um, keep your finger here for a second. Okay? And I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Okay? Revelation chapter 2. If you don't know where that is, it's at the very end of your Bible. It's the last book of the Bible. 
flip a few pages forward, and we're going to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. So after Paul dies, actually, um, the Apostle John is the last apostle that's left, that's still alive. And an angel comes and basically tells him to write this letter to the church in Ephesus. Okay, so to the Ephesians, this is the message that, that Jesus has to this church. Okay. Verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands. It says in verse 2. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but I've tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Okay. This sounds like a church that is faithful, growing in faith in Jesus Christ, making sure that they're learning the right things, making sure they're not learning false doctrines and false uh, um, words from God. And on top of that, it sounds like they are also enduring. Right? They are patiently enduring. They are loving each other. Okay? That, that fits the description of the church that Paul describes in Ephesians. But look at what happens in verse 4. But I have this against you. I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. So the idea is that they have lost their first love. So they are doing things, but they are losing the, the purpose of why they're doing it. So they are growing in their faith, they're uh, protecting themselves from false doctrine, they are um, enduring patiently, they are loving each other, but they've forgotten why they're doing this. And you know, we have a tendency to do this as Christians. We lose sight of the context of why we're Christian. We think that reading the Bible for reading the Bible's sake is a good thing. We think that praying for prayer's sake is a good thing. Okay? And there's a tiny part of those things that are good, because sometimes you don't feel like doing those things, and sometimes you do need to do them for the sake of doing them. But doing something for the sake of doing something will not be enough motivation to get you through all of that. Right? If you're just reading the Bible for reading the Bible, take a few days and then it'll be gone. But if you're reading the Bible because you want to get to know the God who wrote the Bible, that's a bigger motivation. Right? Think of your education. Right? Think about the reasons why you go to school. Think about why you're motivated to study, why you're motivated to do the things that you do. Some of you guys, you're, you hate school because you're studying for studying sake. You're only doing geometry, you're only doing algebra, you're only doing trigonometry, you're only doing history or English or whatever for the sake of doing that class. Right? And this is why you complain all the time while you're in math class. Oh, I'm never going to use this again in my life. Why do I have to learn all this? <laughs> That's right. But a part of you is correct. Okay? I'll know. Right? I, I graduated college and I graduated high school and I don't use most of that stuff in my life. Okay? My daily life. I don't use those skills. Okay? I have a calculator. That's what does math for me. <laughs> but the idea is if you don't recognize why you're doing what you're doing, it's going to be a drag and it's going to suck. And that's where a lot of you guys are. You don't know why you're doing what you're doing. You don't know why you're studying. Some of you might say, oh, to go to a good college. Why do you want to go to a good college? So I can get a good job, or I can meet a good husband or wife, or so I can make money, okay? So ultimately, is money the motivation for why you're doing what you're doing? Right? Is money the reason why you study? Is comfort the reason why you study? It's not, because ultimately, those things are so far ahead that you can't even begin to acknowledge the, the motivations behind those things. And it's very, very difficult for you in the moment when you have to study and you have to stay up and you have to do all this stuff. You're like, I don't think this is worth it. Right? So you have to have a context for why you're doing things that you do. If you don't have a context, it's going to be very hard to get through it. Same thing with spirituality. Same thing with faith. If you don't desire a relationship with Christ, it doesn't matter. None of this is going to go anywhere. And it's just coming to church and doing church for the sake of doing church, for the sake of coming to church. Right? It has to go beyond that. And that's what Paul's pointing to. Paul's pointing to the Ephesians and saying, look, there's a dangerous thing that's happening that you guys may not see. And the dangerous thing is this. You're doing church for the sake of doing church. And you've forgotten and you've, you've um, uh, laid aside the idea that really the point of doing all these things is to know who Jesus is. Right? It's to know him in this way. Okay? To have real, deep, full, intimate, and thorough knowledge of Christ. 
That's the goal of the Christian life. Everything that we do in church is to point you in this direction. That's the goal. Okay? That's the end goal. This is where we're headed. Um, G.A. Packer says this in the book, Knowing God. There's a difference between knowing God and knowing about God. When you truly know God, you have energy to serve Him, boldness to share Him, and contentment in Him. That's what Paul's pointing to. Paul's pointing to this idea that, look, tasting something and then having someone describe to you what food tastes like are two totally different things. When you taste food that is amazing and it makes your, your taste buds go nuts, right? It makes your eyes grow wide and it makes your heart beat faster. It's like you're in love, okay? That's what good food does to the human body. I don't know if you know that, but it does. It's the same thing. So the idea is when you think about Jesus, when you think about God, do you get the same sense? Is it this excitement? Is it this contentment? Is it this energy to serve him, as J.M. Piper says? And for a lot of you guys, it's not. For a lot of you guys, it's not. There's nothing. It's just complete apathy. There's just complete you care about Right? And it's just, you sit there. And it's just... um, we're reading a book with the worship team in the mornings. By the way, 8 o'clock every morning, we sit in that corner for, from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, and we basically, we share prayer requests, we read a book together, um, we talk about things in regards to worship. Um, any of you guys are free to join us during that time. Okay, you can come in early in the morning, you can come and you can, it's basically a devotional time that we have. And one of the things that we're doing is we're actually reading a book together called Look and Live by a gentleman named Matt Papa. He's a worship leader, and he says this, okay? he says about, of himself, he says, I grew up in the Bible though. And when you're in church every night of the week, because that's what you do, your knowledge of God can become worse than demonic because you forfeit the ability to do the one virtuous thing demons do, which is shudder. Okay? Because in James chapter 2, it says, you believe there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Right? That's what James says. James says, look, knowing God and knowing about God are two totally different things. Even the demons know about God. And when they think about God, they shudder. They have a reaction to God because God is holy and they are not. And what Matt Papa is saying is basically, for those of us who have grown up in church, we've lost the ability to even shudder. The fact that God is holy and that you're a sinner means nothing. It's just whatever. Because in your everyday life, you don't meet and you don't, you're not faced with the kind of guilt and the kind of um, opposition that you should be faced with. And for some of you guys, that's God's judgment on you. Right? Your life is so comfortable, you never think about guilt, you never think about shame, you never think about your sin, you never think about the fact that you are a terrible, horrible sinner, and the fact that you never think about those things is God's judgment on you. That's not God's blessing on you. God's blessing is when you're living a terrible life and someone confronts you, someone stops you, something happens to say, stop, you're living a terrible life, you need to turn, you need to repent, you need to come to God. And that's one of the reasons why, for me too. Look, this is not a comfortable message. I don't like the fact that you guys don't like me. I know a lot of you guys don't like me, okay? And I know that because what I have to say is not popular. What I have to say is not something that warms your heart. Because oftentimes, you have forgotten that God is holy. And you have forgotten that we are sinners before a holy God. And that's the part of the gospel that, yes, it's the part that says, it's the part where Jesus says, if you preach this, people won't like you. But I have to do this because this is what's true. The way that I love you as a pastor is not to sugarcoat the way life works. The way that I love you as a pastor is to say, this is what's true, this is what's real. Most of you live in a fantasy land Monday through Saturday, where you're never confronted with eternity, you're never confronted with real things. You're only playing video games all day long, you're watching K-drama all day long, that's all you do. And you're just trying to wipe away and keep in the background all of the stuff that's in your life that's hard that you don't want to deal with. But the truth is, you need to deal with those things. You need to deal with those things. You need to deal with your guilt. You need to deal with your shame. You need to deal with your pain. You need to deal with your suffering. And it needs to go somewhere. And a lot of you guys, you just don't know how to do that because for so long you've just sat at church and decided that this is a place where you're not going to care about what happens. You're not going to listen. You're not going to pay attention. It's not going to matter. Right? By the way, some of you guys are playing video games while you know we're in service. I know. And I pray for you. I could call you out, but I choose not to. But I know, I can tell, right? I see everyone's eyes. I also see when you're holding your phones. And no one reads the Bible like this. <laughs> okay? Or like this. Okay? 
And you can be subtle about it, but remember, your fingers are connected to your shoulders, so when you're going... <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. They're playing games. I know. But you have a choice. You have a decision to make. Right? It does come down to your decision. It does come down to how you're going to approach this and what you're going to do with this time. And verse 18. What is it that Paul wants? He wants the eyes of your hearts in mind. That's my job. My job is to enlighten you to recognize and realize the stuff that you're spending time doing is worthless, and you know it's worthless. You know it's a waste of time because you don't do the same things that you did a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Right? You don't spend your time watching those same things. So you know that those things are going to pass. Those fads are going to change. So what is it that Paul wants us to see about God? It says in verse 18, Having the eyes of your hearts and mind, that you may know... Okay? What is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? Three things. Three things. Paul wants you, I want you, God wants you to recognize and know these three things that you have in Christ, which is hope, inheritance, and power. Okay? So let's go over hope first. Okay? Verse uh, 18 again. Which is the hope to which he has called you. Okay? So the, the first thing that you have to recognize is the thing that we have in Christ is hope. Okay? A lot of you guys deal with depression. A lot of you guys deal with stress and, and um, how do I put it, like a compression in your life where you constantly feel this like, oh, I had this pressure from my mom. I had this pressure from my friends. I just can't be myself. Right? I had this pressure at church to be this, this perfect person, which, by the way, that's a thing that you put on you. I don't put that on you. The teachers don't put that on you. We want you to come broken and, and share with us what's going on in your life. We want to pray for you. We want to help you. Right? This is not a place where you pretend to be okay. Right? It's the not okay to pretend to be okay. But what you have in Christ is a hope, is a real hope. Right? Christians, yes, it's possible for you to get depressed. Yes, it's possible for you to feel like there's, there's nothing out there for you in the future. But you can't let that get you down. You have to come to Christ and bring that to Him because what He promises us is hope. Knowing Jesus leads to hope. And then he says, what's in, in the next part of verse 18, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? Now this is interesting. There's two ways you can read this. One way is the inheritance that you have as saints. Okay? What is the inheritance that you have? We talked about this. It's the inheritance that exists in heaven. It's all the good things that are coming in heaven. But it's also, we get a taste of that now through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit allows us to have the spiritual blessings that we're going to have eternally in heaven. He allows us to have some of that now. Um, I'm talking about comfort. I'm talking about peace. I'm talking about love. Right? All the, 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 the fruits of the Spirit. All of that is a part of the inheritance that we get from the Holy Spirit. However... Another way to read this, and I think this is a better way to read this, is what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Meaning, you and I are actually the inheritance that belongs to Jesus. Okay? So, think of it this way. Before the foundation of the world, before there was any, ever a world, before there was a universe, okay, there was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Okay? And out of love for the Son, God the Father is going to create the entire world. Okay? And out of love for the Son, God's going to redeem a people for the Son as a bride. Okay? This is why we have the language, the marriage language that exists in the Bible. That you and I, we are the church, we are the bride of Christ. Christ is our groom. That language exists because to some degree, that's exactly how God conceived of the world. And he says, I'm going to prepare this beautiful bride for you, Jesus, my son. So we, okay, as Christians, we are an inheritance to Jesus. That's how important we are, right? How much does Jesus love us? Like a husband loves his wife. How much does Jesus care for us? How much does Jesus think about us? Right? How much does Jesus do for us? As much as a husband should be doing for his wife. That's the analogy. That's the way it's supposed to be. And so what you need to understand is the things that we have in Christ is amazing because God himself says, I do all of this for you because you are my inheritance. You belong to me, right? The way that I show off my glory to the entire universe is I show the universe the people that I have redeemed for myself. Can you imagine that? That you are the riches of God, that you are the thing that God holds up in the universe and says, look, look at this. Look at what I get to have. I get to have you. Do you think of yourself that way? We don't, because, again, we're so like, 
bent over by our sin and we're so bent over by our guilt and our shame that we don't recognize that's not how it actually is. We're not actually these dirty, filthy people. Jesus has saved us. He's rescued us. He's cleaned us up. And now he's showing us off to the entire universe and saying, look at that. That's mine. That's what he says about you. Look at you. You are mine. You belong to me. Right? That's crazy. That's nuts. That should blow our mind. But what's crazy is Paul goes even further and he says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? Now what's crazy is in this verse alone, okay, Paul uses four words that mean power. Okay? In English, it's power, working, great, and might. Those four words in the Greek are dunamis, energia, kratos, and ikus, Okay. And basically those words mean inherent power, energy, operative power, ultimate power, endowed power, given power. Okay? So what Paul is saying is that you have power times four. Okay? And he's going to prove it by saying, verse 20, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. The kind of power that you have access to as a Christian is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Which, by the way, is a power no one else has. No one else can raise someone else from the dead except for God. Except for the Holy Spirit. And we have access to that power. Verse 21. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. There is no power in the universe like the power that belongs to God. No demonic powers, no physical powers, no one has this kind of power. Verse 22, And he put all things under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And then Paul comes right back around to talking about the church, because this is where he started. This is a prayer for the church, that we would recognize the hope, the, inherit, the hope that we have in Christ, the fact that we are Christ's inheritance, and the fact that we have access to the power of God. Now, we're going to talk more about the power of God in weeks to come. Okay? And if you have questions about it, please contact me this week. But the idea is basically this. As a Christian, you have the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in you, to, number one, to save you from your sin. Salvation itself is a power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Secondly, it's sanctifying power. A lot of you guys deal with sin and you beat yourself up and you ask yourself, why do I sin, why do I sin, why do I sin? Because you're not tapping into the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit. The way that you climb out of sin is not through your own power. The way you climb out of sin is to have the Holy Spirit rescue you out of that. It's to rely on His greatness. It's to rely on His grace. It's to rely on the Word of God to pull you out of that. See, sin is a desire problem. That's the issue. The issue is, when you desire something, you will do all that you can to have it. In order for you not to sin, you have to have the desire taken out of you. And you can't do that on your own. The only way that can happen is for the Holy Spirit to pull that desire out and to put something else in there, in that space that's better and that's greater. That's the way that a Christian defeats sin. That's the way that a Christian overcomes sin and taps into the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, practically speaking, how do we do that? There's a bunch of ways to do it. And again, practically speaking, look, at our church, it always comes down to you, you gotta read your Bible and you gotta pray, right? Sure, but you know what you can also do? You can also think about, you can, you can also think about what drives you and what motivates you. What's the context for your life, right? So I'm gonna ask everyone to close your eyes. I'm gonna ask you guys to pray for a second. What's the reason why you live, and what motivates you to get through the day? See, that's, that's a question we often don't ask ourselves, but when you do, it's very revealing. It tells you a lot about where you are. And once you figure out where you are, then you can have a plan to go somewhere. But what is it that motivates you? When you wake up in the morning, what's driving you to do the next thing? What's driving you to, you know, wash up, or go to school, or eat breakfast, or whatever? What's motivating you to do those things? Some of you may not want to think about this and you say, oh, it's just habit, it's just what I do. No, no, really think about why you're doing what you do. And as you dig deeper and deeper into your motivations, it will reveal, right, at the foundation, what it is that you trust in, what it is that you hope in, who it is that you think you are. And where you get the ability to do those things. Again, it's a, it's a reverse of this hope and power that we have in Christ. What motivates you in the morning to wake up and do the things you do? 
Why do you brush your teeth? Why do you eat breakfast? Why do you talk to or not talk to your parents? Why do you talk to or not talk to your younger brother and sister? Or, or do you help them? Or do you not help them yet right anymore? Like, what is the motivation behind the things that you do every day? Your behavior in class, your behavior at school, after school, why you hang out with the friends you hang out with. We don't have enough time to go through all of those thoughts today, but if you went home and you sat down for an hour and you listed out the motivations for your day, you would very quickly discover what's most important to you. And some of you guys need to do that. We need to do this because we need to find out at the bottom what is it that I'm living for, what is it that I'm living for. And I think a lot of you guys will come to the conclusion that you're living for some really shallow things. And you're living for some things that can't and, and won't satisfy you in the long run. And if you know that's true, there is a better way. There's a Savior named Jesus who loves you, who dies for you, who cares for you, who considers you his inheritance, who is willing to take your filthiness and put it upon himself give to you his perfect life, his righteousness, and then display you in glory for all of the universe to see. He could not be prouder of you. He could not be more infatuated with you. He could not be more in love with you. That's the Savior who is worth living for. That's the Savior who gives us hope. That's the Savior who calls us into inheritance. That's the Savior who gives us the power to go through our days Living in this sinful world, it's hard. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that you would shake us out of our apathy, shake us out of the, the stability that we find ourselves in where we're just comfortable being in a place where we don't care. And I pray, God, that you would shake us out of that. And as we take time, maybe today or some other time during this week, to think about our motivations, Pray, Lord, that you would show us the emptiness of our lives and you would show us that there's a better way. There's more that we can do with our lives. There's more, Lord God, that you want to do with us. That you are better than all of these things. You are greater than all of these things. And I pray, Lord, that we can have a full, a deep, a real, an intimate, and thorough knowledge of you and that that knowledge of you would drive us every single day towards satisfaction, towards comfort, towards peace, towards a real, solid joy that exists in our heart. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to grow deeper in that knowledge of you every single day. Help us, God, to recognize that the context in which we live our life is so important. And help us to recognize, Lord, that we need to have a context for our relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray.